Good afternoon, everyone. It's really wonderful to see so many of you out to see Professor Hogg. Uh, my name is Pat Parody. This is our second uh, lecture for uh, the 2018 uh, year, and we're very, very pleased to have Professor Hogg here today. I, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the fact that we are on Treaty 6 territory, which is the traditional land of several First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people uh, who negotiated Treaty 6. And so um, I'd like to just uh, hand the mic over to Professor Eric Adams. Many of you will know uh, Professor Adams as our constitutional professor extraordinaire, one of our many constitutional professors extraordinaire, but certainly extraordinaire. Just did a CBC interview on the jurisdictional issue involved uh, with the pipelines today. So anyway, Professor uh, Adams, over to you, and he will introduce Professor Hogg. Thanks, uh, Patricia. Welcome, everybody, and especially to our, our special uh, guest. It, it makes uh, constitutional enthusiasts uh, like me pretty excited to have someone of uh, Peter Hogg's stature uh, here at the University of Alberta. And uh, if I gave you the traditional list of uh, Peter Hogg's awards and honors, it would fill our hour, so I'm not going to do that. But I will talk a little bit about, for a moment, about how, even though he's spent his uh, career at the University of uh, York at Osgoode Hall Law School, he's actually spent his career at every law school in Canada. And that's because the phrase, can I borrow your hog, uh, is uttered in every uh, hallway and library of every law school that I've ever been to. And I noticed that the intensity with, with that, which with that phrase gets uttered uh, tends to go up around March and April. Um, and uh, it's really a testament to his abilities uh, captured in that magisterial text uh, uh, on Canadian constitutional law that has, that has been, for a generation of students, lawyers, and judges, the reason that we have found so m much rich and wonderful material in this, in this topic. In a world in which specialists find their own little constitutional niche, Peter Hogg reminds us that it is the entire fabric of Canadian constitutional law, its federalism, its indigenous rights, its separation of powers, and of course, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms that actually stitch together to form a, a comprehensive whole. And I'll, I'll, I'll just end here. As a, as a graduate student, I was deep in the Ontario archives one uh, winter day, uh, looking for interviews with old and retired judges. And in those archival holdings, I stumbled across a, uh, an interview in 1991 with, with then Professor Peter Hogg. And I thought, this is amazing. I'm, I'm going to read this, this interview. And I was remembering that this morning. I went back to my notes to see what I had written down about that interview uh, that that Peter gave in 1991. And I, and I noticed two, th I, I had two notes about that interview. The first was I felt it really important to write down that his birthday is March the 12th. <laughs> so happy almost birthday, uh, Peter. It's way off, yeah. yeah uh, so that made it into my notes. Uh, the second thing that made it into my notes was this quote. This is what Peter thought in 1991. He said, I've always been of two minds about the Charter of Rights, because on the one hand, I admired the ideals that are represented and supported, and I supported the civil liberties that it protected. But I did have serious reservations about the huge increased power that the courts were receiving through the Charter of Rights. I do still believe that it is a major disadvantage of the Charter that we have turned so many political questions into legal ones. Maybe one of our, our questions for today is, is is does uh, 2017 Peter Hogg still feel the way 1991 Peter Hogg felt? And is the Tunaha decision an, another place where we, where we wonder about the capacity of, of, of law to actually deal with a complex matter such as the colonial relationship between Crown and Indigenous peoples? With that, I hope you'll join me in welcoming Peter Hogg to the University of Alberta. Thank you, Eric. Um, the, I don't think, no, I'm not using that. Um, one of the first things I had to think about with the Tunaha case was, how do you pronounce this K-T-U-N-A-X-A? -A? Um, and the answer I was told in British Columbia, Tunaha. And, uh, in New Zealand, the uh, Maori language is K 
completely phonetic because that's the way it was transcribed by the white settlers. Um, and, um, and so you can always figure out a Maori, the, the, the pronunciation of a Maori word uh, from the spelling. And um, that, that's not true here, and I've, uh, that's a puzzle that I've never quite, uh, uh, you know, how do you come up with a word like K-T-U-N-A, A-X-A, which doesn't have any obvious pronunciation. Um, anyway, that, that's not the topic of the talk today, but it's, a, it's, a, it, it's, it's, it's an interesting puzzle. Well, let me just, uh, why don't I just give an outline of the case? I think you've, you've got it in front of you anyway, but you, you'll, <coughs> it'll be easy for me to uh, tell you more, uh, tell you uh, what's on the piece of paper you've already got, and, uh, and we will have uh, opportunities for questions. I look forward to uh, answering questions um, at, at the end. If I leave about 15 minutes for questions at the end, so I'll just take my watch off. And this usually means that I donate a watch to the institution where uh, I took it off. I'll try not to do that this time. The, um, uh, <coughs> the issue in Tunaha was the, the minister of the BC Minister of Forests wanted to, and in fact granted a permit for the construction by a private company, Glacier Resorts, of a ski resort in a valley in southeastern British Columbia. The First Nations objection was the site of the ski resort was an area of spiritual significance to them. It was also, and I think this was part of the spiritual significant, significance, it was home to an important population of grizzly bears and it was home to the grizzly bear spirit, a principal spirit within the Tunaha religion. So they had their problems with this. And for 20 years, consultation, 20 years, consultations had been going on between the Crown, that was the BC minister, no doubt a succession of BC ministers, and uh, Glacier Resorts, that was going to be the developer that would, uh, that would build the uh, ski development, with the Tunaha, and there was another First Nation, the Shaswap First Nation, which also lived in the valley, and which also shared some of the same concerns as the Tunaha nation. Um, what had happened by the time the case went to the Supreme Court, the uh, Shaswap had moved their opposition to uh, support for the project because they took the view that the benefits from the ski resort in terms of employment and greater economic opportunity that would be would flow to the First Nation uh, outweighed the uh, concerns that they had expressed before. But the um, uh, the Tunaha um, uh, took the position that they, their position hardened and. Um, it seemed to be something to do with um, the Tunaha had the Tunaha had a knowledge keeper who to, who was he was an elder and he was consulted on important spiritual issues and so it may well be that many of the uh, actual Tunaha Aboriginal people did not have strong views about this, but the knowledge keeper told them that the proposed development, the knowledge keeper had developed this 
idea only a couple of years earlier that the proposed development would drive the grizzly bear spirit out of the valley, which would uh, irrevocably impair their religious beliefs and practices. And so after fruitless attempts by the minister to uh, revive the consultation process and reach agreement, this was after 20 years, the minister declared that reasonable consultation had occurred and just approved the project. So the the Tunaha's proceeding was for judicial review of the minister's decision to approve the project. And the Supreme Court did not handle the case in quite the way that uh, any of us, I think, would have expected. Um, they decided that the minister's decision to end consultation and approve the project was reasonable and that since reasonableness was the standard of review for issues of mixed law and fact, like this one, the court unanimously upheld the minister's decision. Now, I don't believe any other claims of Aboriginal right have been disposed of as cavalierly as that. It did not seem to be a drilling down on a First Nation religion focused in a particular, on a particular piece of land. Um, and to say that uh, uh, reasonableness is the test for the minister's decision to go ahead with the project, um, I think surprised me. Well, it did surprise me. And I tried to find other cases where Aboriginal rights or Aboriginal claims had been dealt with in that fashion, and I couldn't find any others at all. Um, so that was, that's a bit of a puzzle. And uh, now, the, the freedom of religion point was also, I think, uh, very inadequately um, dealt with. Chief Justice McLaughlin, who of course has just retired and who of course is justly revered for the contribution that she has made to Aboriginal rights and treaty rights, she's written nearly all the court's opinions on those topics and on balance, more than on balance, they are overwhelmingly supportive of Aboriginal treaty, Aboriginal rights and treaty rights and the whole focus of things like consultation to protect uh, Aboriginal people before rights have actually been established all that's been constructed by the Supreme Court, largely by Chief Justice McLaughlin, who I think has written almost all of the opinions. I don't know how they'll write them now, uh, um, now that she's retired. The, um, I think there's a rule that you can contribute to, to opinions for about six months after you retire, so I certainly hope she does that, but that's not, <laughs> it's not very long. Um, Anyway, on this one, um, it, it is not the classic uh, McLaughlin at all because she, she simply focused on freedom of religion as if it was the freedom of religion that you or I might assert. She didn't treat it as an indigenous right that had to be respected in accordance with Section 35 of the Constitution. So she, she and uh, Mr Justice Rowe, who wrote for the majority, said that freedom of religion, and I was struck by the fact this is the analysis that would be applied to freedom of religion, uh, which was asserted by non-Aboriginal people. But this was a religion that was asserted by indigenous people that was focused on a particular land 
that was of great spiritual significance to them. And to just treat it as a Section 2A freedom of religion case seemed to me to be surprising. So uh, anyway, that, that's what they did, including uh, chief, the Chief Justice. And they, they started talking about Section 2A of the Charter, the Guarantee of Freedom of Religion. And uh, they said, well, it has two aspects, the freedom to hold religious beliefs and two, the freedom to manifest those beliefs. And in their view, the minister's action did not interfere with either of those aspects. The Tunaha continued to be free to believe in the grizzly bear spirit and to engage in any religious practices that followed the belief. Now that, of course, part of the belief was that the grizzly bear spirit would disappear if this project was, uh, was approved. So uh, I suppose you can continue to believe in something that has disappeared, uh, but that seemed like a rather silly point. Um, and um, they then said, and I thought this was sort of a bit picky and argumentative, they, they said, that, you know, the claim, the Tunaha claim is to protect the presence of the grizzly bear spirit itself. But the state's duty under freedom of religion is not to protect the is is not to protect the object of beliefs, such as the grizzly bear spirit but to protect everyone's freedom to hold such beliefs and to manifest them in worship and practice or by teaching and dissemination. So the majority's conclusion was that the minister did not violate the Tunaha freedom of religion because they were concerned about the grizzly bear spirit itself um, and we don't really regard that as a legitimate religious belief. <clears throat> the, uh, uh, Mr. Justice Moldava with uh, Madam Justice Cote wrote a concurring opinion and he took the view that the proposed resort would be an infringement of Section 2A, but again, he's talking about 2A, he's not talking about Section 35. Because by driving away the grizzly bear spirit, it would render the Tunaha beliefs devoid of religious significance. However, the infringement was saved by section one of the charter. Well, you can save breaches of the charter of rights under section one of the charter, but you can't save claims of Aboriginal right under section one of the charter there's a much more elaborate process to, uh, uh, to uh, infringe on Aboriginal claims, as you all know. Um, so again, this was talked about as if there were no Aboriginal people here at all. Um, and, and he then concluded very limply, the minister had taken account of the Tunaha's beliefs and appropriately balanced their Section 2A right with his statutory objectives of administering Crown land and disposing of it in the public interest. I look back on the other Aboriginal cases going through my book, which of course is the best source of... Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 and um, I, I couldn't find any cases where an Aboriginal right was dealt with on the fact that it had been appropriately balanced 
with the statutory objectives of administering Crown land and disposing of it in the public interest. So, I'm really very surprised by the case. It just doesn't seem to fit the pattern at all, the pattern that has basically been established by Chief Justice McLaughlin, but which uh, she didn't, um, um, and she wrote this decision. But it's almost as if the Tunaha did not exist as an Aboriginal group, as a First Nation, and it's as if um, a group of non-Indigenous people were asserting religious claims uh, in respect of this, um, in respect of this uh, uh, development. Why don't I stop there and open it up for questions? Just wanted to let you know that we have two mics, uh, one over there and one over there. So if you have a question, uh, please come to the mic, and um, I think Professor Hogg will be happy to answer questions. And I just need also to let you know that we absolutely must stop at a couple of minutes before one today because a class is coming in. So if we have to cut you off, I apologize in advance. So uh, Professor Hogg is going to going to manage the uh, questions. Sure, uh, Professor Hogg. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Rath, and I just have a quick question for you with regard, well, not necessarily quick, but with regard to this decision. Do you think that the outcome would have been different had the Tunaha argued, instead of religion in the context of grizzly bears, um, the idea that because grizzly bears are so sensitive to development, their ability to hunt grizzlies, as an example, would have been completely eradicated by the development by scaring them out of the valley, or alternatively, arguing it in the adjunct to, of an Aboriginal title claim, as opposed to trying to make a freedom of religion claim in this context. Because it seems quite odd to me, too, that a claim of this nature could be so easily disposed of on, you know, simply on the basis that it was. Uh, that would probably have been a stronger position. And I don't know why they didn't advance it, but I think the reason may have been this. They had been advancing that position in opposition to the project for a number of years. And of course it was very important because it was going to interfere with the grizzly bear habitat and, uh, and their reliance on uh, the grizzly bear in the valley. Um, but what had happened in the interim, the case is complicated, and this may explain uh, something about the puzzling nature of the decision. It's, it's complicated because there had been a lot of discussion of that over the previous 20 years, and the scope of the project had been altered so as to not interfere with grizzly bear habitat as much as it originally was. And so they had got, uh, they had won a lot of those more practical points. Uh, obviously they still thought it was going to interfere with grizzly bear habitat, but uh, that had been dealt with in ways that the Crown, I think, thought was satisfactory, and the Tunaha, thought, seemed to think, was satisfactory. That they, they had come to a much um, stronger position of opposition close to the litigation of the case than they had been before because there had been a lot of give and take and things like, well, can we adjust this project so that it doesn't interfere too badly with grizzly bear habitat, et cetera, et cetera. Those were the kinds of issues they were looking at. And, um, and so they'd had a great deal of success in doing that. Um, the grizzly bear spirit difficulty for them was harder, harder for them to, to 
resolve by some kind of compromise. Because certainly, if you're talking about the ability to hunt grizzly bears as an example, that's something that's measurable. And certainly from the perspective of setting up uh, consultation litigation, you know, as an example, the First Nation could have made a demand that they shut down all non-native grizzly bear hunting in the region as a form of accommodation. And then failing that, the case would have been stronger. But, you know, and again, without disrespecting anybody's religion, to simply say, oh, okay, well, our belief is X, you can, to a certain degree, see where the Supreme Court ended up, where they ended up on it. it you know, it's, it's, it's certainly not something that's measurable or identifiable no, <laughs> from no. a rights perspective. No, I, I, I think this is a very good point. And the practical issues, the practical issues that you or I would have regarded as terribly important, quite apart from any religious issues, they had been dealt with pretty well. Uh, you know, the other First Nation had given its consent, and Tunaha had um, been comfortable with the negotiations and with the changes that were done. So I think the Tunaha had kind of backed themselves into a position where they couldn't make that argument anymore. They'd won that argument, and, uh, and so uh, part of the explanation for the case probably is that the Tunaha claim was much weaker than it would have been had they been able to use uh, actual impairment of grizzly bear habitat and uh, as the objections to the, uh, to the project. They'd worked that through and they were still concerned about it, but it wasn't a big thing anymore. Of issues, you're left with the old axiom that hard cases make bad law, and I guess that's where we end up with it, right? Yes, I, I, I'm, yeah, I think that's right. That they were left with arguments that, at least to the Supreme Court of Canada, didn't look that strong. Thank you very much, Professor. Professor Hogg, um, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Megan Conroy. I practice in the Aboriginal law area on behalf of Métis communities and First Nations. Um, two questions. One, um, can you remind us if uh, counsel uh, for the First Nation exclusively ran their appeal on the Section 2 issue or if they had as an alternative ground Section 35? And second, um, I'm wondering if um, there has been a comparative analysis of the Oaks test, justification test, versus the justification test you know, embodied in Section 35. In my experience, practically on the ground at lower courts, um, the Supreme Court's lofty words <laughs> are often, um, uh, and the hope that they give, often don't play out on the ground. And in the case of um, running a case on consultation, like an appeal based on a lack of consultation, the remedies are not great. I mean, the remedy, if you are successful, is to go back and consult with the party you've just been in court with. So I can sort of see the strategy in, in trying um, the Section 2 argument because um, it's a harder hammer, I would say, than, than, and better remedies possibly could flow from it than Section 35. Yeah, and I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I didn't listen to the argument. I didn't, didn't realise when the case was being argued how interesting it was. <laughs> and so, so I came at it late. Um, and, uh, and I've now, of course, I'd very much like to have been a fly on the wall while they, ar while they argued the case. Um, so I, I don't know the answer to that, but I think they probably did feel that, um, that they had a strong freedom of religion argument and, uh, and that that was more likely to fly than the more practical issues that were raised uh, uh, by the student over there. Um, and um, so, uh, and no, it would be very interesting to know more about that. Just one other comment, and I don't um, purport to speak for any community, but I've been told by elders when they explain to me um, when they go out on the land or when community members go out on the land and hunt and gather that that is part of their religion. So. Um, the concept of religion isn't compartmentalized like how uh, Western thinking would think about it, where it's compartmentalized and you go to church on Sunday and that's kind of it. It's a, it's a more holistic perspective. So 
I think the Supreme Court totally missed that, but I don't know if it was argued. Uh, I, think, uh, I, I think that, is, with respect, is exactly right. And, um, and so what puzzled me about this was that this was a religious belief that was rooted in a particular piece of land, uh, the grizzly bear spirit, a piece of land in which grizzly bears uh, were free, you know, were, uh, uh, were numerous and were uh, uh, enough to provide food for food and other clothing, of course, for the Aboriginal people, and. Um, uh, it, 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 in my mind, it was a mistake to great degrade that to a pure freedom of religion argument. And, uh, but um, that's what I, I, I believe it actually, re actually reflected the argument on that point, mm -hmm. although I didn't listen to the argument. Um, so, no, it's, th th those are puzzles. <laughs> I always feel like a rock star when I get to ask a question into a mic. Um, hello, Professor. I, um, I myself work in the uh, province of Alberta in the heritage uh, resource management sector. And I'm wondering if the outcome of this decision, because Indigenous uh, sacred belief is so tied to, to place, it's tied on the land, Will this decision hinder any type of advancement in other statutory departments to protect Indigenous sacred place based on the concept of religion put forward by McLaughlin? To protect? Place on the landscape that is solely identified for spiritual practice. More of a permanent protection. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, well, if on the face of it, it doesn't seem to give nearly enough weight to that claim. Um, on the other hand, no other case that I'm aware of has treated that kind of claim so lightly. So I think it's kind of a it's kind of a one-off, and uh, and I think what one of the things we're all puzzling about in the room, certainly I am, is why it is a one-off, mm -hmm. but I don't believe that it's going to make it more difficult for Aboriginal people to assert religious uh, beliefs and have them respected by the court. That's right. You know, in terms of Crown uh, legal interpretation, it's, it's very uh, strict, it's very narrow. They like to go to the letter of the law. And uh, when it comes to making decisions on sacred places. Um, the consultation table is just a terrible place for these um, ideas to be negotiated. It would be, be more beneficial to get ahead of the consultation and, and, and not leave it to the um, negotiation between a proponent who's been delegated the aspects of consultation rather than the one that holds the duty, which is the crown, the duty to consult and the honor. And so that's what I'm just wondering if it, it'll be interesting to see just how far different jurisdictions go in, in Utilizing this decision, and, uh, I don't. Uh, <coughs> I don't see any reason why a religious claims couldn't be included in consultations, and I think they were in this case, mm -hmm. and there had been some recognition by changing the project in various ways to have less effect on grizzly habitat, and and presumably therefore less effect on the religion, the, the religious beliefs that were so focused on grizzly bear habitat. So I, I don't think those things are impossible to negotiate with, uh, in good faith. And um, uh, it's just that the non-indigenous parties, the government, you know, does have to go to some effort to understand exactly what it is that is concerning the, uh, the First Nation. Had the nation in this sense, sorry, this will be my last comment and I'll step aside. Had the nation also uh, recognized, like had they identified that they were utilizing that place for spiritual practice or was it the belief that was tied into their concern? And would their claim have been stronger if they could have identified that they were using it 
for spiritual growth. Nothing, nothing was said in the case okay. about that rather important practical point. Mm. So the assumption of the court seemed to be that they weren't actually using the place uh, for the purpose of worship. Okay. All right. But, uh, Hello, Professor. Hi. Um, I'm a first year law student, so my question is completely out of ignorance with a hope to learn. Um, so I hope you can take it on just on that basis. Um, I'm just wondering if it's possible that they chose to advance it as a freedom of religion case as opposed to an Aboriginal right to religion case because, as you'd mentioned, it was the wisdom keeper who came up with the main objection, so it was therefore maybe not a commonly held belief. The rest of the Tunaha maybe didn't know at that point. So would that be possible that that's why they chose to advance it as one instead of the other? Perhaps. I, I, um, it was my first, uh, this is, shows my ignorance, I think, of uh, Aboriginal First Nations i worked with Aboriginal First Nations for about 10 years in the Yukon, so uh, helping the Yukon Indians with their land claims and, se and self-government agreements, all of which have been finalised now. So, so I've had a nice experience with that and on the, the side of the angels. <laughs> and, uh, um, but... Um, I was so pleased to talk about that, I've now lost your question. <laughs> Sorry. I was wondering if it was possible they chose to advance it as a freedom of religion case as opposed to an aboriginal right to religion case because up until the wisdom keeper had said this was an issue commonly amongst the Tunaha, um, just from what you had said, it didn't sound like it was a commonly held belief and an aboriginal right has to be a commonly held belief. Yes, <coughs> I, that, that may well be right that the... The fact that the knowledge keeper came up with this quite late in the piece. In fact, I think he said he'd only formed the view a couple of years ago um, that the, this would uh, damage the, uh, the grizzly bear spirit, etc., etc. So it may be that, uh, that um, the uh, religious beliefs were not as widely and universally held among the Tunaha people because they did rely on a knowledge keeper to, um, uh, to in effect, hold the beliefs or, or to keep him, himself informed of the beliefs. Uh, and, and just make a point earlier on, they don't appear to have had practices, uh, religious practices that celebrated their, these beliefs. Thank you. And that may have hurt them in the Supreme Court too because it looked like a, a more, um, um, you know, last minute the court said, well, it doesn't matter if the religious belief is not very old. We, we don't care about that. That's what they said. But I suspect they did care about it and it, and it, and it hurt them. Yes, uh, Professor Og. Uh, so I'm just looking at, the, I suppose one aspect of trying to combine Section 35 and freedom of religion is you'd have to have a strong evidentiary base and maybe they didn't proceed in that way and, and wanted to focus more directly on uh, freedom of religion. But perhaps if they wanted to, um, to underscore the freedom of religion taking place, with, you know, being um, practiced within the Aboriginal context, um, what would be, were there arguments or, or are you prepared to offer us um, a test that would better balance the, the competing interests of the, the wider public goals uh, with, with the specific uh, freedom uh, of religion? Um, one aspect, I, I suppose, is manifesting your beliefs in worship and practice uh, may well have a physical dimension, I would have thought, whether it be even in Christian, Jewish faith, uh, you've got churches that might have tremendous significance. Uh, can they just be demolished and there's no freedom of religion issue? Uh, so it may be that they just didn't handle that part of it well, but, but is there a better way, is there a test that would better balance the competing interests? I don't know the answer to that. I think 
the test that was applied here has never been applied before to deal with an Aboriginal claim of freedom of religion. And um, <coughs> usually, the, um, in order to defeat an Aboriginal claim, a, an, a rather extraordinary effort, historical effort and the like has to be, uh, you know, the, you, you usually have to, one of the things that's uh, unusual about the case is that most Aboriginal rights go back to time immemorial and evidence is given of, of the long-standing belief and of the belief, as this is all hearsay, of course, the belief that people at the time of contact held that belief. Um, and um, and for, for things like fishing rights and the like, that's the way it's all, always been done. But in this case, they, they obviously were not able to say that, and they didn't say it. So I think that probably hurt. And what, what would be a better test for balancing the interests? Do, do you have any suggestions there? You obviously well, are critical of this test, and, and many of us might well be. I well, I, I think that the, um, the, uh, <clears throat> the test that should be applied is one in which it would be very difficult to override the religious objection except with the consent of the Tunaha people. And the Tunaha people did almost come to an agreement about this project. And it was just very late in the process that the knowledge keeper said, no, if, if you agree to build buildings on this land, the grizzly bear spirit will disappear. So. Um, so I think, um, I'm not sure that I'm answering your question as well as I should, but uh, um, <clears throat> they, they, they were not able to make as strong a case as would be normal. I looked at uh, other Aboriginal rights cases and they all had the characteristic, all the ones that I looked at had the characteristic of a right that uh, <clears throat> that went back to time immemorial and was uh, utilized uh, um, uh, uh, before the arrival of uh, European contact, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and that the fishing rights, the hunting rights, the uh, co collecting rights, in some cases commercial rights. Um, this didn't have those, those qualities. Okay. Thank you. Hi, Professor Hogg. Thanks again for coming to Edmonton. Um, my question is if you could elaborate on what authority was cited in the majority's assertion uh, that the state's duty under Section 2A of the Charter is, quote, not to protect the object of beliefs? I don't think they did <coughs> cite any authority for that proposition. I think they um, thought of that while they were writing the opinion. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And it is true that the, the more conventional beliefs, the European type beliefs, not just European, but, uh, but the, the mainstream religions, um, you know, they don't focus on a particular... Well, I, I don't know whether that's quite true. There's a considerable... I'm a Christian. There's a good deal of focus on God, mm -hmm. and uh, um, uh, so if something was going to make God go away, I think Christians would be upset. <laughs> 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 yeah. So, uh, yes, I'm, I'm not sure what the force of that point is at all. Um, yeah. <laughs> but it's true that the religious cases that they've, they've had have not faced that kind of issue. You know, I've had cases about, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, school, school child, a Sikh child wearing uh, the little dagger at school and, and school boards getting upset about that. They've had cases about uh, um, <clears throat> um, uh, Jewish uh, 
members of a condominium <coughs> constructing dwellings on the balcony in violation of the condominium's rules because that was something that at least some Jews believed was necessary for Jewish belief. So, you know, it, it's all been very different and very practical. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cool. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Professor Hogg, sorry, Jeff Rath again. I was just looking at the decision itself and sort of the idea that uh, the case turns strictly on the, on the two-way point. The Supreme Court itself says the record here supports the reasonableness of the minister's conclusion that the Section 35 obligation of consultation and accommodation has been met. The Tunaha spiritual claim had been acknowledged from the outset. Negotiations spanning two decades of deep consultation had taken place, etc. So I guess another way to look at this case perhaps would be um, that cases where there's been 20 years of consultation and accommodation, um, you know, the courts have a limited patience for and say, look, we've done as much as we can. And at the end of the day, you know, this new claim that the spirit will be driven out of the valley, dress it up however you want. It looks an awful lot like a veto to us. And in this case, the minister engaged in deep consultation over 20 years and enough is enough. I mean, is that a fair interpretation? Yes, I think that would be <coughs> a perfectly fair interpretation of the decision, although they certainly clouded their reasoning by not saying that very forthrightly. But yes, I think that's right. It had, the negotiations had been going on for a very long time. There was no suggestion that governments were uh, negotiating in bad faith. In fact, lots were accomplished in the negotiations. And, um, and maybe the court was saying, well, <coughs> that's enough. Can we do it for another 20 years? I don't think so. <laughs> and the Tunaha, of course, was saying really that we don't want to negotiate anymore because the, the impact on our religion is just too severe. But yes, I think you're right that was. Professor Hogg, all of us in this room, or many of us in this room, seem to feel that this was a case about Aboriginal rights, but the Supreme Court of Canada clearly felt it was just about the charter and administrative law principles. Yes. So, from the point of view of the precedent this has set, has this done anything in the realm of, of Aboriginal law? Has anything changed? <clears throat> no, I don't think it has been changed because I think if one were concerned about <coughs> the uh, easy way in which the claim was defeated here in another case, one would say to the court, in Tunaha, this was not treated as an Aboriginal claim. It was treated as a, a freedom of religion claim. They were quite explicit that they were treating it as a freedom of religion claim that might have been brought by anybody. And so I don't think it is going to be a harmful precedent where, the, um, uh, where there is a clearly indigenous claim being made. Don Padgett with Alberta Justice. Thanks for uh, teaching me years ago in Toronto. Um, I was just thinking of a couple of areas of law relating to freedom of religion that might inform it a bit, but not necessarily give us a lot of hope. Um, appellate courts have dealt with zoning of churches, and the answer seems to be every municipality must allow them to be zoned probably outside an industrial park, because that's what some Quebec municipalities left for certain churches and mosques. And you can, you can imagine what church that was, and you'd be right. Uh, so, yeah, the appellate courts told them they had to find a place for it. So that, that case law doesn't give us a lot of hope here because one can easily say, well, you can do the activity somewhere else or the belief or the practice. And then in uh, Loyola that went to the Supreme Court, it was about a Catholic private school, and the court talked about a collective belief or institutional belief and layered on additional requirements for a collectivity or an institution requiring a continuity of that belief uh, unlike an individual who could have come up with a religion yesterday, argue it today, even if it doesn't get as much weight. So I wonder if um, you have any comment on the zoning type cases or Loyola in terms of the institutional belief. And in that case too, it didn't get a lot of respect because the answer was 
you can still practice it and believe it elsewhere in your one Catholic religion class, but you can't control what's going on in all the other classes where provincial uh, curriculum was going to impose something on the private school. Yeah, I don't think, <clears throat> I don't think that is an analogy. I'm well aware of the problem of zoning, which uh, has made it very difficult to build uh, churches and synagogues and mosques in areas where people live and would like to attend them. Um, and, um, but, uh, I, I mean, perhaps it, it shows a fundamental downgrading of the importance of religious claims. That, that perhaps is there something in that 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 has that does make it difficult. We've had these problems in Ontario about uh, um, <clears throat> about um, finding locations for uh, churches. The zoning, the, the zoning uh, laws simply don't say anything about churches, or if they do, <coughs> they give them a little space to build on, but um, you can't have all that many churches in a small green patch. Um, so, <coughs> excuse me, I have got some water here somewhere. I'm, that's all right. Um, so uh, I, don't, I don't think I don't think that that's an analogous issue. Thanks, sir. Pat. Now, if I haven't completed your question, tell me tell me some more. I just mentioned Loyola, and there was mention of institutional or collective uh, belief in something which had a somewhat different and more involved test than individual belief. Can you guys hear over here? Yeah. Is it on? Okay. Mm. I had a quick question. Um, so in listening to your talk, I, I personally think that there was a an issue with separating section two and section 35 in the first place. Um, I don't think that they should have necessarily separated the two because they're intrinsically tied. The freedom of religious practice and the Aboriginal rights in this particular community are connected to one another. Um, although I think section 35 argument should have been put forward a little more, um, it's not necessarily the only one that should have been focused on the decision. So. My question to you is, um, based on the idea that uh, you had a note on the knowledge keeper uh, only having formed the view a few years ago, and my, my question is, do you think they considered the fact that it might not have necessarily been a part of the collective memory of the community because this isn't necessarily something that they would have imagined would have happened, that the grizzly bears would have been gone, that their environment would have been affected in such a way? Um, you know, having that forethought or foreseeing the bears disappearing may not have been something that was a part of their collective understanding of the bears and the bear spirit. Um, I think that um, my issue with this is that it creates the ideas that indigenous beliefs and spirituality are frozen in time. It brings back that frozen in time argument. Um, and it takes away the ability to be understood um, that indigenous people are people who are fluid in their systems. And I think that it does apply understandings of other religions where it creates the expectation that there has to be some sort of structural connection. So for example, the idea that somebody who is Christian is able to pray in their home, pray outside, pray wherever they want, or pray in a structure that is set for them whereas indigenous people are not given the same benefit in this particular argument because the idea is that, well, you should be able to practice your spiritual beliefs wherever you are, whereas there is an intrinsic tie to the land. There is a specific tie to the bear itself, the physical bear, um, and that maybe the possibility never came to that particular community, the idea that the bear would never be there because it is their connection to the bear to create that protection for it. <clears throat> yes, <clears throat> I, th I think that that is a very different claim than the one that uh, 
a Christian or a Jew or a Muslim would make. And, um, and <clears throat> we have to recognize that these um, religious beliefs, which are focused on particular parts of the land, which is being used by Aboriginal people and, um, and has been for a long time, are, are somewhat different. The, um, the, the, most of the Aboriginal rights cases have concerned things like um, uh, fishing rights, hunting rights, uh, uh, rights to build shelters, things like that. And the line of argument in all those cases has been to show that the right went back before European, before European settlement. And that was part of recognizing the right. Um, and um, the Tunaha couldn't do that with this particular belief, apparently. And, and anyway, they didn't try and do that. And in fact, much was made of the fact that they'd hardened their position because the knowledge keeper had come up with the proposition that the grizzly bear spirit would disappear, go away if, uh, if they, um, if they uh, uh, constructed the development as proposed. So it, it is different from other Aboriginal rights cases. And it may be that because of that difference, they decided to simply rely on freedom of religion under the Charter of Rights, which, of course, is open to Aboriginal people to assert, no less than non-Aboriginal people. Well, uh, with that, we're going to have to bring our session to a close. I just want to, to say that it's been very wonderful to have uh, your point of view, Professor Hogg, on this case. I think many of us have been concerned about the case and the way in which it was decided, so it was quite reassuring for us to hear your analysis of the case and your critique of it. So thank you very, very much, and thank you for engaging. I would also like to invite you all to come this evening. Professor Hogg is going to be speaking at 5 o'clock here again on uh, constitutional remedies. So thank you very, very much, and thank you to all of you. Thank you, Pat.